So hello everybody, colleagues old and colleagues new, and great to see, great to see everybody here. And just to say that I feel a bit kind of eh, talking about advocacy when I have some very practiced advocates in the room and some very practiced people on the other side of the fence as well. But what we say in advocacy is be careful and be respectful because your enemies today may be your allies tomorrow. And I worry, I use the word enemies just so. But people that maybe you're looking for something for today or not on your side, maybe your allies tomorrow. So <coughs> respect all around. So I'm going to try and hop through this in a way that I hope is intelligible. I'm going to cut short a little bit um, because I think everybody does want to hear uh, Kitty Egan and um, <coughs> we want to make space for that as well. So Pat is going to kind of keep an eye on me and time me out if I want too much. So if some of my slides come up and I'm not dwelling on them, it's maybe perhaps they're connected with others and they're a bit self-evident and I move through. Okay, so really what I was wanting to do today, the fun bit, what is it, why engage with it, some of the ethical considerations that I think we need to be aware of, um, look at one or two approaches and look at some of the challenges, because there are challenges in advocacy, and particularly in times when there isn't a lot of money around and a lot of finance that comes, people might be concerned about what happens if we step out of line or if we say something that the other side doesn't want to hear and they control the purse strings. Let me say that from my point of view and the position I hold and will continue to hold, advocates are as much players on the pitch, they're not horrors on the ditch, they're as much players on the pitch as anybody else. And I absolutely believe in the power the strength of advocacy and of the essential element that advocacy brings to the work that all of us are engaged in. Now then, first of all, just very quickly, what's it not? What is it? It's a process of change. It's not a one-off event. It's not therapy. It may well be that as people are going through a therapeutic program, that at some point advocating around it may be something that they wish to do, but people need to be careful about engaging people who are perhaps not ready for that stage, so it's not a therapy. It's a tool for challenging social injustice by influencing and improving the system. The system will never be right. We will always be seeking to improve it, both the people working inside it, inside it and the people advocating to it. It's targeted, seeks to shame the fr sh shape the framework in which issues are seen, and it, it aims to propel us all, the citizens, the policy makers and the government, towards making, taking significant remedial action. There's a definition of it, and they have the, the presentation here so people can, can get that. Just to give you kind of two examples from there, um, try to, to, one of the things that we would have been involved in in the past about you know, pushing for change would have been the whole campaign um, by a number of groups to get contact centres for children who require uh, contact with parents but where there may be some issues either because of per parental disharmony or because of risk of, of, uh, to the children in some way. And the last one there, trying to prevent post-post changes, the last one that I was actively involved with was the campaign led by Open, that seven is too young, the proposal by the government that lone parents would come off their own parents' book and go on to job seekers when their youngest child was seven. And that in a time when, as we know, uh, quality places in preschool and after schools are not readily available, and anyway, of jobs. So, um, very much Seven is Too Young, which is an ongoing campaign, or, uh, led by Open, but supported by Bernardo's and the National Women's Council, is saying, this is not the right time, and Seven is too young. Another definition there, okay. Act of publicly representing an individual um, audience to look favourably on or accept the point of view of, a, of an individual, an organisation or, or an idea. Just talking a little bit and based on what Mark was saying this morning of two wonderful presentations that actually fit quite well in here about communities. Um, I remember, and Pat will remember, and I see a couple of other people who are still around in those days, when the targeted family support, the springboard <coughs> projects as they were called, were being introduced into areas. And at that time, I was a childcare director with Bernardo's and was asked to, Bernardo's were asked um, to be involved in running some of those. And we did a lot of work within communities, because there were communities in which Bernardo's were not known as well as ones that we were known. Um, persuading communities, which is a great thing, but also can exclude um, of the need for 
family support in their area because <laughs> their fears were that people who uh, would be coming in, but be you know who had needs, but coming into their area, uh, you know, despite the fact that obviously most of those family support projects were rightly positioned in communities that needed them. So that was a whole big kind of persuasion to do, uh, not by fooling people about what was going to be going on, but by presenting the information in a way that they could understand and engaging them in in, in the process. Okay. <coughs> Advocacy is not something to be frightened of. It occurs all the time as a natural, natural, uh, natural phenomenon. We advocate for ourselves, for our rights, for what we want. Our extended families advocate for us sometimes when we're perhaps not in the position to do it ourselves. Community can be a great advocate and spiritual leaders advocate. We might not always be pleased with what they'll be saying, but they're, and it's a natural phenomenon that happens. Okay. There's two kind of major um, types of advocacy identified. At the micro level, you have individual or client advocacy. And I like <coughs> the definition of this from the King's Fund. But there's two types of individual um, advocacy. There's the instructed advocacy, where you're doing what the client wants you to be doing. The client is fully involved and you're acting with them. So you're doing, you're walking by their side and you're, 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 you're at all times talking to them, involving them about what they want from this exercise. And every childcare worker, social worker, family support worker and many others does that. And I hope does it, um, and I'm sure they do, acting with the client. There's also non-instructed um, individual advocacy where people act for the client. There can be reasons for that because of inability of the person to engage at that time, a whole lot of reasons for it. And in some of the studies that's been done looking at that, it is clear that sometimes, particularly children and young people, um, are concerned about whose voice and does the person acting on their behalf actually take their voice away? And what, how do we work to make sure that people are participating? Because what might be a great solution for me might not be a great solution for the client, and obviously, at all stages, we're not talking about situations where there's a protection, an overriding protection issue involved. So I think when we're when we're advocating on, on the micro level, we need to just be aware of that, be aware of who we're working for. The advocacy that I'm going to talk more about um, is at the macro level. It's systemic, and it's, it, it aims, and it doesn't apologise for itself, <coughs> at structural change in legislation, policy and practice in order to influence public policy, to influence resource decisions and sometimes to produce legislative and constitutional change. And one of the big ones that we would reference here would be the change in the constitution to have children's rights inserted in the constitution. Twenty years ago since that campaign was effectively kicked off by the Kilkenny report and it's taken a while. And we're not quite there yet because the matter is, 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 is before the courts. But it took that length of time, it's, I, the idea waned and came up again, and that's how it goes with advocacy. There is very seldom a time when you can get something clearly through. My only experience would be that in Ireland we're very good at reacting to crises. We're not good at planning change or systemically going through things and coming up with, with solutions we, and as they say, never, let, never lose an opportunity when a good crisis presents itself. But the important thing is to have done the work and to have the solutions ready. So sometimes your voice can appear as if it's there for a long time without influence, and then something happens and there. <coughs> and politicians and governments, all of them, like when there's a solution proposed that they can come out with when the crisis hits. <coughs> Why do it at all? And I think, obviously for some of us, for some people and lots of people here, it is a natural thing to want to do, to want to make things better for people, to want to make things better for ourselves, to not want to make things better um, for, for people. But I liked this, 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 this reason. We all know that some of us view the, the, the nature of the causes of social problems differently. Some people believe that they're generated by society, that the very way we are organised as a society, and I don't mean we in Ireland, I mean most societies, but we generate the social problems. We set 
out, for example, the housing policy that puts people into very poor housing, isolated from services. We decide what level of income is going to go for people who find themselves dependent on the state. And we create systems that is difficult to break through. Um, one of our speakers this morning spoke about um, the issues that are created for people coming into our countries, where they're segregated, where their rights are not organized. And for many years, that was certainly the position, in my opinion, that children who came in here as um, young people without their guardians were put into here. They were treated differently than we would treat Irish children that we needed to come into the care of the system. The other way of looking at it, and I think you can see it very strongly now in some European countries, is that the individual is to blame for their own social problems. Very much back to the days of the deserving and the undeserving poor, the striver and the shirker. The language is quite crude, but it does belie, this is the fundamental thing, that the individual is responsible for their own problems. And the other way here is to look at it as an interplay, an active interplay between these mechanisms. I suppose that's the liberal view of it. Um, I'll leave, you, leave that to you to, to, um, to decide where, where it should be. Um, but that's the one that I'm going to kind of go with today in terms of, 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 of why we advocate. Another reason, I would think, is because if you have a social focus to what you're doing, it aims at systemic and political changes the individual focus aims at individual behaviour change to combat poverty, poverty, for example. So, 100 ways to cook mints, budgeting. They're not mutually exclusive, and I'm not saying that the individual behaviour change isn't a valid thing to do, because it helps the person in the here and now. But I suppose that would be, that would be, the, that would be the, the difference. Um, I think when supported by um, our colleagues in philanthropy, we were to start an advocacy program, an active advocacy program in Bernardo's, who had always been involved in it. Um, there were some suggestions, and not from the philanthropy, I have to say, that we would might campaign for people to send their children, actively campaign for people to send their children to bed an hour early. Um, I didn't think that was a valid use of time, and that that wouldn't be the way that you'd be going for behaviour change. If children are out late and you need to do something with parents, that's the individual advocacy and the work of the childcare workers, the people who know them in the community. Um, I didn't think they'd appreciate me getting up to tell them that that's what they should be doing. <laughs> okay, now, why do we need it in family support? We need it because our families exist in a social world. And Mark, I think this morning, really touched on the importance of community <laughs> and the importance of the local. Family support is part of institutional civil society. But for me, and something that I would have witnessed and experienced myself over my years in work, is that the starting point for much of the work in family support is disadvantage, social inclusion and poverty. And I really believe that the problems emerge first on the ground. They're not seen at governmental level for a long, long time. They emerge on the ground, and one of the things that I would be hoping that family support networks, etc., would do would be to collect these problems as they emerge. Because often you find, and certainly once Bernardo started to work throughout Ireland, be encouraging our staff to tell us what was going on for children and families. I remember many years ago, I think it was a meeting that Pat may have been at, a meeting with the minister, when um, there was a discussion about the emergence of heroin as a problem in our society. This wasn't in the 80s, now it was in the 90s. And I remember saying to him, look, Minister, we are being told by people working in our family support um, work that this is now a problem down in our towns. And he said to me, no, it is not. It's all right. It is not a problem in our towns. I asked the Commissioner of the Police and he told me it wasn't. And I said, well, I have to beg to differ. But a few years later, yes, it was a problem in our towns. It wasn't a city phenomenon only. So I think that that's just one example, but there's loads of ways. So I would urge networks to look at how do you collect the collective experience, if you like, that people are suffering. I'm not saying that you can always do something about it, but that it is really important that people of all sorts working on the ground don't ignore what are common problems. Even if at the time, even as only a way of getting support about how you might deal with it, how the community might deal with it, and communicating it up. The goals of advocacy for family support, they're good, they're the kind of nice things that we all want to know. 
encourage active citizenship. And again, you heard a lot from Mark um, this morning. And, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> from Mark this morning. I thought well, maybe this wasn't a fuzzy bit. <laughs> it helps to build social capital. It encourages creativity. Communities are great, and I think um, our second speaker this morning, whose name unfortunately has escaped me, gave lots of examples about how creative people can be when they get to look and to be involved in the rural issues. Improving the quality of life for the families we work with, I hope it's something we all want to do. And participation, all of them being covered this morning, I won't go back on them, but if you marry, marry, marry the three together, uh, you'll understand that. Why do it together? Common interests come from people wanting things, having to depend on others to get them, and a mutual acceptance of a common morality. Best way I know, the best thing I've read about saying why, why together? What, what binds us together as a community, whether our community is the local, the national, or indeed the international? I looked at finding an ethical checklist for advocacy, for <coughs> systemic advocacy, and I couldn't find one. So I went off and I looked, and this one comes from public relations. And um, they're trying, or have been trying very hard to kind of, to make, I suppose, to, to knock out some of the cowboys out of public relations, out of PR, they get a bad name sometimes. But they ring very true for us as well. And then I've put in a couple of others that I think apply as well. So the first five are from uh, Baker and Martinson. Tarries, truth, that you advocate using the truth only, that it's authentic, that you have respect, both for those you're advocating for, for yourself, and for those you're advocating to, that you consider the value of equity. For example, <coughs> I hear quite a lot recently, attempts being made by various people to say, don't give this to the elderly, give it to the young. Uh, particularly, I noted, I heard it in, um, from in, in, in English, um, someone in England recently saying that the elderly shouldn't get their free bus passes, they should give it to the young to encourage them to go to work and to make it easier for them to go to work. And you think, you know, let's not start pitting the elderly against children, the carers against the disabled, that's not an equitable thing to do. <coughs> and socially responsible. Um, any of you who are on Twitter or anywhere like it will know that social responsibility seems to be lacking sometimes in what people are advocating for. I've added in it just a couple of more confidentiality, particularly where you're involving groups who are, and working with groups who perhaps are marginalised, who can be victimised, and again, I think that was covered very well this morning, in protecting people, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a pejorative way, but in protecting people because you know that once you're out there, you're open to all kinds of things. <laughs> the other one that we'd want to note about is consent. Consent for people who are being involved, making sure they are not, not the token client, the token person to be involved. And I think this is for all of us, that our actions at all time should be consistent with our personal values, our organisational values, if we work for an organisation, societal values and the human rights of all involved, even when we're sometimes challenging some of our societal values. Core values for me is about informed choice, about justice and about empowerment. At the end of it, if at the end of a campaign, at the end of many campaigns, I think we need to be able to cross, tick list these and come out on the right side of 50 or 60 percent. What does advocacy do? I think the process is that the first thing it does, it questions how things are. Because if you're going to leave things the way they are, you wouldn't question them. You'd say, this is good enough for children in care. This is good enough for people who've been in the care system. This is good enough for families who are pushed further and further back because of the situation in which we all find ourselves. So it opens up space for discussion and for questioning. And if we give up on questioning the way things are, we're not going to do our jobs and do them well. It's inclusive and it engages with people. And who you engage with obviously depends on what it is that you're doing, what particular piece. 
that's really important. You need, if you're going to be involved in advocacy, whether it's individual or um, at a systemic level, you need to identify the issues and define the problem. And that's not as easy as it may seem. And I'm going to give an example in a few moments, and I think where, 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 where probably the problem was got, if you get the problem wrong, your solutions are going to be wrong. Is the problem that we need more of something? Is the problem that we're not working with what we can? Is the problem that we have too much of something in one area and nothing at all in other areas? So there's a whole lot of ways of, of going around this. But we really must identify the issue and define the problem. And I think if you're doing it, you need to get more than your own idea about what it is. You could be entirely right, but I mean, when I say that I started my life here, we were involved in student politics because there was a lot of it around in the 1970s. It was great. But after a while, we were always talking to ourselves. So we thought the revolution was happening tomorrow because I believed it and someone else, all my friends believed it. So you really have to go outside your own experience and outside people who are like-minded and agree with you to really see how do others see it and really define the problem. And then you need to say, well, look, if that's the problem, what are our aims at the end of this? And what are the steps along the way? I think you can see that in our present debate on very, very difficult issues for Ireland, on very difficult issues because of recent tragedies and that people are going from here we are and there's where we're going to be and nothing will do unless we're here at the end. It's unlikely we'll be here just yet. There'll be steps along the way. And for some people that's very difficult to accept that there may have to be intermediate, intermediate steps. But that doesn't mean that you give up, that you give up completely for the, for, on what you want at the end of it. Okay, how do you set about doing that? If you've got a problem, if you're in, involved in an organization, and you've identified a problem, and you think, well, is this something that we should advocate about? Is this something that we should campaign about? I think one of the first questions you need to do when looking around is ask, is this issue a good fit for my organization? It may well be that it's a good issue, it may well be that it is extremely valuable and valid, but is there, are there, is there another organisation or a group that is better placed to take this forward? And certainly in 2005, this is what happened in Bernardo's when we were looking at establishing what was going to be our advocacy agenda for the next number of years, was to do exactly this. Some things you would say, that's yet, but it's not ours. There is somebody else better placed to do that and we will support them in them doing that. And then to identify who's your allies in this, who's on the same, who's on the same page, who can be on the same page, even though it, they wouldn't immediately seem like a, a natural fit. And importantly, where's the opposition going to come from? There's always opposition. It's valid to be, in, to be opposing it. It's not that you're right and they're wrong. It's just that we maybe see things differently. <coughs> it's the opposition we have to convince, not ourselves. We really need to rigorously test, I spoke about this a little bit ago, our understanding of an issue. And my example would be, way back uh, in 2000, from the mid-90s, the whole issue, and I'm going to use it as an example because it's very topical, of the provision of childcare began to become an issue. And I'm not going to rehash the whole thing from start to finish. But once we got the buildings up, and we needed buildings, but everybody involved, we were only one, one, one of the players in it, knew that we needed more than buildings. We needed good quality staff because the evidence was already there. If I had a penny for every time someone said to me, Nora, produce the evidence and then we do it, they don't. They, they're <laughs> that doesn't work that way. The evidence about the benefit of preschool, quality preschools for children. The evidence about the damage to children of poor childcare. It's always there, been there for a long time. You wouldn't even need it to be researched to know it. Although Pat is right, I'm very in favour of research. But you wouldn't, you know well that what we witnessed and what we saw, if that was to be going on in a widespread thing, how bad that is for our children. So we were campaigning for training, for more training, for quality assurance, for program, for something, for an absolute curriculum for children, and for the rigorous enforcement of standards and the linking of standards to public money. Coming up into 2007, when there was money floating about the system, 
And obviously, part of the opposition to childcare was, to that kind of childcare was, that women who chose to be at home, parents who chose for one of them to stay at home, felt that having that kind of a debate about childcare was in somehow disempowering their position and disrespecting their position to stay at home. There were two by-elections in the environs of Dublin. The government of the day lost the two of them. The big issue on the doorstep was the cost of childcare. That's what the focus groups and all of that afterwards said, this is what's going wrong, this is what you're doing wrong. Cure childcare and you'll be home to try. So at the next budget, lo and behold, every parent of children under six got a thousand euros per child into their hands. And there wasn't an investment in training and quality standards in developing the curriculum. Um, that was hailed as this is going to cure the cost issue. Because the cost, no doubt, I'm not suggesting the cost wasn't an issue. What happened? Cost and preschools went. Oh, how much we got by? Ooh, approximately a thousand. Um, did it have to take a genius to know that that was what's going to happen? No, it didn't. But there was an opportunity then to do something that was well evidenced and it didn't happen. So sometimes you can be on the side of the angels, but there's an election, okay? <laughs> when there's an election coming, the side of the angels don't always win. Now, I have to say that many of the people involved um, at departmental <coughs> level were quite surprised by the outcome. It wasn't designed by them, just to say that, just in case anyone thinks I'm having a go. Um, and you can think about it <laughs> So what was the issue? What happened? And that was continued. The next year it went off. Now it was very diff difficult to come out and say, I don't want families to have an extra 3,000 euros. Very difficult. So we were all on foot. What would you be saying? I said, no, you know, thank you. Um, you know. And so, but, you know, the real outcome was not the outcome that happened on the day. And the next year it went off. And the year after that, the economy fell apart and it all went away again. And we saw the result a couple of weeks ago. So now we're thinking about more training. Now we're thinking about minimum standards. And now we're thinking about enforcement. Although I do have to say, lest I be quoted, I thought the major issue that those programmes pulled up was about support of staff and management responsibilities. I didn't see any sign of any supervision or help or support. So why should we be the slightest bit surprised? But let's get the solution correct, let's analyse the problem properly and not think that more inspections, that would never happen if there was an inspection. What off the record and popping in inspections might have done was shown up absolutely that the regulations that are there in terms of um, numbers of adults per children were not being adhered to at all. And I was going back to loving Nick Clegg, I'm not loving him, that's a bit strong, <laughs> but having some admiration for him when he stopped the increase in the number of children per adults in England recently, where it was proposed that people could mind, mind a lot more toddlers. I'm thinking, no, they can't. They can't. This is not right. Something dreadful is going to happen to children, as well as them not being nurtured and getting the kind of experience they need. Nora. So, Nora. You know, they're right, okay, that's good. I'll move on. And rigor rigorously test what you're doing. Okay, I'm going to move on there. Propose the policy solutions, test them, identify your audience. You need a campaign for each audience. Who are you trying to reach? Reaching the public is very different than reaching the government, reaching the opposition. <coughs> Don't forget everybody. Identify how you're going to measure your success before you start the campaign. It's very tempting to make it up afterwards, by the way, because you can then make it look quite good. <laughs> but you're not learning if you do that. Um, I'm not going to back it People sometimes want to, to advocate, but feel that they can't. And some of the challenges in advocacy is about your agency, its role and its mandate, its view of advocacy. How is the policy in relation to any issue um, arrived at in your agency? Is it handed down from above or are you involved in it? Is your client involved in it? Whose role is it in to take on that position? And are there conflicts with other agency roles? And I think that's something that people we could spend a lot of time on because it's something that people need to work out and agencies need to work out. The other challenge sometimes is that you can overclaim and set up unrealistic <coughs> expectations and then everybody is disappointed when that doesn't happen. 
our unrealistic timelines. We're going to go looking for a big change in our constitution and we'll get it done if we campaign hard for a few months. No, we won't. Overemphasizing negatives to get a hook. I've seen this done and I'm sure you all have been all have done it. And when the media talked, they said, give us a poor family. We want to talk to a poor family. And you're thinking, no. Um, they don't want to hear, they want the human interest piece. And you're thinking, yeah, it's an important issue. I need to, need to get this covered. Please be careful about the results can be stigmatized, pathologized families and communities. And I don't have to give the examples. One of the worst ones that I um, came up with, seen personally, was involved in personally, was a lone parents group in Finglas where I worked when I came back from England first and where what appeared like a very genuine attempt to understand the, the, the pressures on lone parents turned out of lone parents really being the, 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 the most awful things been written about them and kind of small things been blown up as if this was their whole life and it teaches you a lesson. <coughs> Be careful that the problem doesn't get exacerbated, as I think it probably did for that group that time. If you're involving anybody, either yourself or clients particularly, make sure that they're prepared for media involvement before, during and after. People have been taken up and then let, let down and not coming back again and they wonder what's happened. And some of the stuff spoken about this morning, that it singles them out in their communities, can be very difficult. Confidentiality versus campaign needs. What's the outcome? Is it what you wanted? Can you live with a stepped approach? And then to monitor the implementation. If we did nothing else, we need to monitor the implementation of policy. Because sometimes what comes out the other end doesn't look anything like what you thought was going into the machine. <coughs> Working in coalitions very quickly. There are issues with coalitions that people need to be aware of. If all you can agree about is the lowest common denominator, maybe you shouldn't be in that coalition. Some people will go so far, some want to go there. Can you arrive at something that's good? Organisations, if you're working with organisations that were, are not well regarded by the system you are trying to influence, you're going in maybe with a bit of a ball and chain on the back of your leg. Not saying you shouldn't do it if they're a valid part of the partnership, but be aware. And coalitions throw up leadership issues. Who's, who's the really big person here now? Who's really going to lead this? And that can be taxing and take a lot of energy away from the work. And finally, a quote from a social worker from whom, way back, beginning 1916, 1905, 19 at that time, American social worker, really for me, is there a need for advocacy and family support? Read this. The good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. From Jane Adams. Her stuff is quite good and well worth looking back, even though you think maybe she doesn't. This is a quote from 1906. She was a Nobel Peace Prize winner and uh, someone I think that anybody involved in working with communities should maybe look back. Again, very quickly. Emerging problems often seen first by those working at ground level. <coughs> Power to make the connection between policy makers and those directly affected by the decisions. And people do like it when they hear their family type problems, their community problems discussed in our democracy, uh, our democracy in Thaw. I was going to say in Thaw the Shannon, but that might we might not have that. Um, in the Thaw, in a meaningful way, not in a way that puts them down, but someone saying, look, it's recognised. And the last one you'll be pleased to know, saying thank you very much for listening. <laughs>